I'm not really allowed to speak here tonight because it's not meant to be a political meeting. Uh, so I can't really speak on what I think, but you, I think you know what I think. As regards Dr. John Marx, he is coming here tonight. He called me at precisely 20 past seven, and he was in a place called Sleaford, and I'm not sure where that is. Um, and he's heading towards you as fast as certain laws will allow him. Uh, if anyone has any idea how long it takes to come from there, does anyone know? Over an hour. Okay, so he'll be over an hour. Um, so until he comes, he's probably, as you know, a very, very eminent man. He's a consultant psychiatrist. And he set up um, in Liverpool a system whereby heroin addicts essentially would be given whatever heroin they wanted um, free by him, i.e. prescribed on heroin. Uh, crime went down. The Liverpool police force went on his side. Everything was working very well, and he developed a model uh, called controlled availability, uh, which was that drug abuse diminished if people could get what they wanted in some sort of controlled fashion. Uh, eventually, his outfit was closed down for political re reasons, all of which have remained vague. Uh, he's a great campaigner against prohibition, works ceaselessly, tearing around the country on his own expense, attending meetings like this, of which there are many. It's hard to coordinate them all, but there are many people who feel like us. And he's going to be a bit late. But I hope you all wait for him. I know some of you perhaps can't. I guess the very latest he would turn up here would be between 9 to 9.30. Would do me a hell of a favor if you waited for him, because um, he's gone to a tre tremendous sort of expense and sacrifice to come here. Right, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and apologies for my lateness. Um, the last remark that you heard there about um, learning how to use cannabis, I would think grates on a lot of Joe Public's ears at the moment. Said, Why should we be considering using this at all? Uh, the argument that I like um, goes like this. Uh, um, you can buy things more dangerous than any drug, more dangerous than heroin or ecstasy or cocaine, let alone cannabis, in any hardware store. And uh, just as we teach our children the dangers of knives and hammers and things, and how to use them carefully for our benefit and use, so the prohibition denies us that opportunity with drugs. And most of the disasters that occur with drugs and the dangers that accrue from them are due to this lack of learning and lack of familiarity, accidents, let alone the fact that they are pervade in criminal, secret, <coughs> insanitary circumstances with no quality control whatsoever. And therefore drugs are dangerous because they're prohibited. They're not prohibited because they're dangerous. They're dangerous because they're prohibited. And I'll tell you why they're not dangerous uh, they're not uh, prohibited because they're dangerous. Um, by kicking off with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who was reckoned to be one of uh, the best of American president, presidents. And uh, he said, truth stands alone. Only lies need government support. And this is seldom better interest, I illustrated than in the case of drugs. Um, take, for example, the government's current bête noire <laughs> ecstasy. Now, in the five years up to 1993, the government reported 50 ecstasy deaths. Now, they were described as such, but in fact, no self-respecting pathologist would attribute any of the deaths to ecstasy. In fact, one of the ones in Blackpool had nothing but rat poison in it, warfarin, sold as an ecstasy tablet. Nevertheless, that went down as one of the 50. There are several cases, such as the, the well-known death of Leah Betts, uh, said to be due to pure ecstasy. Well, first of all, if you 
drank something like five liters of water. She'd also taken quite a lot of alcohol, cocaine, and methadone. But more to the point, same night, but more to the point, a whole variety of drugs, yes. But more to the point, um, the pathologist's report said ecstasy with the usual adulterants. Now that meant that there weren't dog-worming tablets or something ground into it. It meant that it was ecstasy that had been produced by somebody without anything else being added. But of course, the black market laboratories aren't like ICI laboratories with quality control and all the rest of it. There's the usual byproducts of synthesis, some of which are quite toxic. So that even so-called pure ecstasy, this black market, isn't going to be pharmaceutically pure by any means. So again, no pathologist would accept even those as the death due to ecstasy. But let's concede, which I wouldn't, all those deaths to the government. 50 deaths in five years. The number of ecstasy do doses taken per week ranges from one to five million. The best guesstimate by social sciences is two million a week. The government, in their inimitable way, say, well, we reckon it's about 200,000. Ten times less than any uh, of the best social scientists estimate. Let's grant the government that as well. Let's say it's only 200,000 a week. If only 50 weeks a year, this is the average, then you've got 10 million doses taken a year, or 50 million in five years. Now, 50 deaths in 50 million, I think you can calculate, is one death per million. Any medical textbook will tell you that fatal allergic reactions to penicillin occur one in every 200,000 administrations. That is to say, even adulterated street ecstasy is five times safer than pure pharmaceutical penicillin. The, uh, uh, the case is even more dramatic for another E, eggs. And we're at the moment in the case of extracting the annual deaths from allergy to eggs. Far greater than eggs. <laughs> now, uh, another point that I'd like to make is that um, the vast majority of drug users are never seen by doctors or arrested by policemen. Only the tip of the iceberg comes to us. And the uh, drug addict who steals or um, burgles or uh, is arrested in court or comes to doctor's clinic is as untypical, as unrepresentative of the totality of drug takers, even of heroin takers, as the skid row alcoholic in the gutter is unrepresentative of alcohol users. And most of them don't think there's anything wrong with them. And certainly doctors can't see anything wrong with them. Colleagues of mine would often uh, uh, address police audiences, and one of them might have been a drug taker. And they would ask, how do you identify a heroin addict? And one would be giving them a lecture in front of them. Now, I'm not saying that heroin is harmless, uh, but it is a medically uncontroversial fact that you can inject heroin in doses to which you are tolerant daily for a week, weekly for a month, monthly for a year, annually for decades, and still function as you and I are doing now here today. That's an uncontroversial medical fact. So it's clear, obviously you can overdose if you're a naive user, and you can still, if you're a chronic user, still take more than is appropriate. But relative to many other drugs, heroin is very safe, especially if approved, uh, used appropriately. It illustrates well that poison in the hands of a wise man is medicine, but medicine in the hands of a fool is poison. Now, as you probably know, in the Merseyside clinics, which were made models of good practice in the 80s, and the harm reduction philosophy spread throughout the United Kingdom and exported to places like Switzerland and Australia, 
until the Americans got wind of it and uh, there was total reversal. The weather vane shifted 180 degrees in the 90s. But during that time, and you may be interested to know that our clinic still survives. We still uh, have uh, patients and we still prescribe heroin and cocaine and um, so on <coughs> to patients. There is a question mark in the eyes of the general public as to the rationale of such clinics. You don't have to explain it to parents. Parents come up very puzzled, sometimes upset that their son or daughter is still being prescribed heroin. But they will say, I don't know why he's being prescribed heroin, doctor. Well, I'll tell you what, we know where he is at night now. He sits with us at mealtimes. He talks to us. He's back with his girlfriend. He helps us down in the garden, you know, all this sort of stuff. He's put on weight, etc. He may still be on drugs, but he's functioning to all intents and purposes normal human being again. Well, why do we give drugs like this to drug takers? Well, all the questions that people ask about the policy boil down to variations on these five. Won't prescribing undermine motivation to give up? Why give up if free junk's available? Incidentally, I don't think it should be free. I pay for my beer. I think that a drug taker should and would be willing to pay the cost price of his drugs at the NHS. But the NHS says, <coughs> sorry, not allowed to do that. And at the same, in the same breath, they turn around and say, we, we can't afford to give it out free. And the drug taker says, it's all right, we'll pay for it. It's real Alice in Wonderland. Um, why give up if free junk is available? Well, those of you who are heroin addicts may be able to tell the rest of the audience here that many of these individuals have alienated their families and friends. They've lost all their money to gangsters or whatever, arrested by the police, put themselves at risk of horrible diseases, hepatitis A and all the rest of it, uh, lost their liberty in prison for long periods of time. Um, I can't think of any greater deterrence than loss of liberty, poverty, disease, and death. So any effect that I might have on their motivation seems to me at the very least marginal. But a chap called Valent has shown that no external intervention makes any difference to the period of addiction of about 10 years. With one exception, shown by a German called Shaw. And he showed that we can increase the abstention rate from 3 to 5% per annum by giving addicts a supply of the drug of their choice. And any doctor or other uh, agency who has worked with chronic addicts will know, counselling them, that um, half their mind is always on where the next fix is coming from. Whereas if that's sorted out, and they get their hair or cocaine or whatever it is, they can actually listen to you and wonder what I'm going to do. And they think about their lives and their family and their career. And they've got the mental space to look elsewhere. And they eventually get bored coming on a nice sunny day and sitting around a doctor's waiting room. Because doctors cannot solve one problem, stopping patients having to wait. They just can't manage it. Um, so most patients, uh, um, as I say, do much better um, on a ration of, of heroin. And it doesn't undermine their motivation. If anything, it expedites it. But far more important than that, and I'll just pop to the next slide. <coughs> this is the empirical results of uh, one of these old British system clinics that they were called. Incidentally, I didn't start this up. I, I'm an ordinary uh, doctor, son of a GP from South Wales, went to Edinburgh Medical School, then did psychiatry, went to Liverpool to the university, where my interests were actually computerization of the electroencephalogram, brainwaves and uh, psycholinguistic languages. I'm Pony, University of Pua, and I have the usual one, mortgage, two kids, cat, all that stuff. So I went to an NHS consultancy. And uh, at that time, the flavor of the month, the government priority was drugs. It's come round to drugs again. But it has in between moved on to mentally abnormal offenders, child sexual abuse, a variety of things that psychiatrists have got to solve. It was then uh, 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 drugs, and my colleague said, sorry, John, you're the new boy, there's the drug clinic. And uh, I got landed with this, and I would ask them all to come in to get off their drugs, 
discussion and I'm just giving a drug claim like we've done before. And then Mrs. Thatcher, as is her wont, uh, um, asked us to evaluate what happened, which is what we did. And we came up with this rather surprising finding. First of all, the police looked at their previous and their subsequent clinical records, uh, criminal records after they joined the clinic, and found a 15-fold fall in criminal convictions, virtually eliminating it, 96% drop. And this, this was being done unbeknown to us. And after all, the criminal records were complete. This is the significant one as far as I'm concerned. You see, in any other system, prison, uh, uh, prohibition, um, even on probation or whatever, but you get your drugs from the street, 10 to 20% of drug takers die. That, that's the most serious medical condition there is. 10 to 20% mortality rate is a mortality rate similar to smallpox in young adults around the age of 20, in the prime of their lives. And every one of them is somebody's son or daughter. And it's all unnecessary. Under maintenance, this drops to zero. And you may think, oh well, but they're still on heroin, or still on cocaine, or whatever it is. But as Shaw showed, giving them their ration of drugs expedites abstention, if that's what you want. But in a way, I could expect that. If you've got clean drugs, if you're going to use drugs anyway, if you get clean ones legally, then you'd expect crime to fall and deaths to fall. Which led a Lancet editorial ten years ago to say, if, doc if, if drug addicts get better in spite of doctors and policemen, not because of them, then our best intervention should be at least to keep the patient alive. Preferably healthy, preferably legal. Which the maintenance system the old British clinic did. In addition, it produced a fall in incidence from 207 to under 16 per 100,000 of the population per year. The incidence of new cases fell 12-fold. In other words, a very powerful preventative effect. Now, going back to the five questions, the second question is it better to counsel and treat someone, well, someone rather than give them drugs? Let me just ask you a question. Could anyone or every one of you in this room please raise your hand like that if you have never touched alcohol? One brave man. Right. For all the rest of you, could you put up your hand if you think you need psychiatric treatment or need to see me after? No, all of you, another one brave man. Now, aside from those two individuals, the rest of you have just displayed exactly the thinking of the drug taker. The drug taker says, I no more need treatment or counselling or all this uh, uninvited, intrusive counselling than any of you feel you need. I mean, how many of you want a homily for, for half an hour on the evils of alcohol before you have your pint? You take your business as well. So, it may be better to counsel and treat someone who uh, uh, is addicted to drugs or using drugs inappropriately. But of course, the best sermon is wasted uh, uh, if you're preaching to an empty car. Now thirdly, won't such a policy increase the total consumption of drugs in society when our aim is to reduce it? Well, we've just seen from that last result on incidents, the preventive effect, it does exactly the opposite. That's the puzzling thing about this, about legalizing drugs and making them legally available. Uh, um, but actually, it reduces consumption if you arrange it correctly. And the rest of my talk after these five questions will be about them. Why uh, not give them um, drink to alcoholics or jewelry to thieves? Well, um, <clears throat> If you were living in Chicago in 1930 and you'd just stolen the purse or the last penny from your grandmother to buy a tot of filthy adulterated meds from Al Capone to inject. Incidentally, how many people do you know who inject alcohol now? I've seen it happen, but it's very, very rare. Because you can buy a bottle of beer or a glass of wine. But it, was, it, it occurred a lot in Chicago in the 30s. And I would have a clear conscience about giving you a bottle of beer or a glass of wine or a tot of Johnny Walker 
in Chicago in the 1930s. On the question of jewellery to thieves, that's a more philosophical question, and uh, William von Humboldt, John Stuart Mill, say that the mature society um, allows individuals to do to themselves whatever they wish. And uh, if you're not con in control of what you do to yourself, you haven't reached uh, the age of reason, or you never will. You're a child of imbecile. Uh, you're, you're essentially uh, on the level of domestic animals, slaves. Uh, the, the free society is the society of free citizens. And all uh, um, such personal activities directed at oneself, even the extreme suicide, is now no longer a criminal offence. You know, homosexuality, prostitution, consenting adults in private type legislation. The glaring exception is, of course, drugs. And the Dutch view is that the whole drug problem arises from this intru intrusion of public law into the area of private drugs. Don't all the prescribed drugs leak out onto the market anyway? Well, in a word, no. <laughs> Fine, you can work out from uh, uh, daily consumption and the number of notified addicts that there's 5,000 kilos consumed a year of heroin. The total medically prescribed is 50. So if you tip it onto the street, you know. However, concerned about leakage, the police, uh, uh, at our request, examined people arrested for six months and found not a single case of leaked drugs from the clinic. But I know it happens. It certainly does happen. But it's a small fraction of 50 kilos in 5,000 kilos illicit drop in an illicit ocean. And as one policeman said to me, Francis Dr. Martin, I don't know why you're worried about leakage. I'd far rather if it were my son that he got one of your pure heroin amples, NHS amples passed on, than some of the mafia street rubbish. Sorry? Methadone? You can't you can't sell methadone in Liverpool. It's poisonous and it's handed out like water. I mean, it's toxic method. But that's another story. I mean, that's the Americans' attempt to stop heroin being prescribed. Um, now, that's, that's just to show how consumption has risen since we stopped the old British system, which uh, GPs prescribed there, then psychiatrists prescribed, and each time it was tightened up, the number of drug users rose through the roof until we've now got 100,000 drug users registered, many more probably uh, not coming. Now the whole problem arises, this uh, 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 perverse consequence of uh, prohibition, through ignoring these two principles, supply and demand, something that you'd think that Western governments held dear. Now, uh, Aldous Huxley wrote in 1954 that humanity at large will ever be able to dispense with artificial paradises seems very unlikely. Most men and women lead lives at the worst so painful, at best so monotonous, poor and limited that the urge to escape is and has always been one of the principal appetites of the soul. The reason to society anywhere in the world at any time in history that hasn't used an intoxicant, a psychoactive substance, to fill the vicissitudes of life, to endure the ups and downs of the world. So there will always be a demand. Where there is an influx and outflow of people, wrote the governor of Edinburgh Prison, no system, however secure, can prevent contraband entering the institution. If you can't prevent drugs getting into a totalitarian society such as a prison, how can you hope to get stop them coming into a free society? So there will always be a supply. Now, this was a, uh, a beautiful piece of research by a man called Westermeyer, who showed the pro-heroin effects of the anti-opium laws in Asia. You stamp on opium, these people start to inject heroin. Just in Chicago, when you banned beer and wine and all the rest of it, people started to inject meth. Peru has had a peaceful coexistence with Toka for centuries. In fact, the Spanish um, historians bore eloquent testimony to the fact that the Inca Empire, far from being destroyed by Coca, was built on it. And yet now, people are injecting, snorting, or whatever, cocaine 
that's really heavy, quite physically damaging active principle if it's used in a protocol. The weak natural substances are far more controllable and it's an indication of the really rather silly way in which our policies are run at the moment that I am lawfully allowed to prescribe heroin and cocaine. Heroin and cocaine are legal in England. It's just a doorway to which they're available. It's extremely narrow. But I can't prescribe opium or coca. It's like I can prescribe whiskey but not beer. Oh. <coughs> this is the graph of supply against demand. If you um, free up supply, such as a free market promoting use, you get um, <coughs> epidemic intoxication. If you go back a hundred years, uh, drugs were freely available, and then after the First World War, they were rationed. Alcohol was rationed by swinging tax, restriction of the hours, and restriction of premises. Special drug dependency claims called pubs, and they were spit and sawdust affairs in their day. And uh, drugs were rationed by the medical profession, and we had a minimum of consumption. Now, since the end of the Second World War, uh, alcohol, the controls on the hours, the controls on um, the premises, you can buy alcohol at any off license, and the uh, controls on price, the real price has fallen, have all been undone. And you've got epidemic intoxication with um, uh, most cases before the law courts, most NHS uh, beds, most road accidents, involving in some way alcohol problems. Uh, and in criticizing the prohibition, I'm not for a moment advocating the drug den on every street corner principle, since I think we don't have the problems uh, 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 that we have with alcohol multiplied many fold for each and every drug. What I'm saying is that if the state is to control any substance, any commodity whatsoever, whether it's chocolate or bananas, it actually has to have a legal. restrict the supply, then criminals meet the demand that has always been. And um, if the state is so rigorous, rigorous as to restrict the supply altogether to zero, to de deny itself a lawful supply altogether, it doesn't get rid of the supply. It just abdicates it to the criminals. And being the second largest market in the world, Gangsters have a vested interest in the return of prohibitionist governments. However, if tomorrow you got 10 years for coffee, you might suppose that as you restricted the supply, there'd be fewer, fewer of you around that would be prepared to murder for coffee. In other words, we all suppose that the supply and demand curve was exponential, went along in a a curve following this dotted line like that. But as you went towards zero tolerance, <coughs> the demand and consequent consumption would fall to zero. We know that in fact under the prohibition, <coughs> use rises. In fact, in no prohibitionist society is drug consumption falling. They're all increasing. Now, of course, even the Western market-loving um, leaders uh, know that as you restrict the supply of something for which there is a demand, the price will increase. <coughs> and the more you restrict it, the, the, the greater the, the tension becomes until somebody is prepared to bust through your sanction. That's what smuggling is. And the more repressive you become, the more that mechanism occurs. And you get a, a principle that I call the Darwinian natural selection of drug dealers. You know, you may be incompetent at dealing, so the police will lift you first, but he is sharp as a razor and can avoid them, and he gets your share of the market. <coughs> and this goes on until you end up with little wars, like between the Colombian Mafia and the American Feds. And that mechanism occurs no matter what the means of repression whether it's military and violent, or whether it's, for example, say, financial. Take the, 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 you know, the much-vaunted Drug Trafficking Offences Act. All that means 
is a natural selection of crooked accountants. I mean, I can't f fill in my tax return properly. No doubt Howard can launder 20,000 through Liechtenstein the blinking of an eye. So you get the Darwinian natural selection in this way, whatever you do, and you end up with black markets and gangsterism. But what puzzled us and what we couldn't explain was, although you might get black markets and gangsterism, why was there an increase in the numbers under the prohibition? You'd think that people wouldn't want anything to do with that sort of, sort of drug use. Well, if you have a one gram habit, sorry, I'm back here. <laughs> what you do, in fact, is uh, you buy five grams, and then you sell a gram to him, a gram to him, and each of those does the same, and each the same, and each the same, ultimately to your children and mine. And they have to do this to finance the high black market price, which is effectively taxed <coughs> by the dealer having to defray the costs of uh, arrest, expropriation, seizures, etc. You may get £80 and £100 you need that way, wheeling and dealing, of course. The remaining £20 you've got to get, say, by theft, but to get £20 cash in hand, you receive about a fifth of, of the real price from the receiver of stolen goods. So you've actually got to steal £100 worth a day the whole value of your habit each day, in addition to all the wheeling and dealing. That's, well, 100,000 addicts, 100 pounds a day, 10 million a day, out of your house, my car. No wonder insurance premiums in the city centre shops are rising. In fact, you've also got to adulterate the drugs to keep weight, to keep them up. As well as this thieving and recruiting, you have to recruit new users to finance your own habit. Insurance companies would love to have salesmen like drug addicts. So, if you deliberately contrive so to do, you cannot imagine a more socially destructive, more individually criminalizing, more physically unhealthy, more efficient way of making drugs available than that. Peddling. And the witness clinic and the British system clinics and clinics right, like them that give a ration give out to these individuals who are prepared to use drugs come what may, the ration of drugs, and obviates the necessity for all this cascade of pyramid selling. So paradoxically, if the ration is well controlled, giving a small amount of drugs to those who will use regardless, or what they need to those who will use regardless, reduces the availability for the man on the street. That's the paradox that we couldn't understand. That giving out the drug, question three, which we found reduced uh, drug consumption, and of course reduced incidence, because it stopped the recruitment of new users, is explained by this pyramid selling mechanism. And there's ex quite strong empirical evidence of that. Well, not quite strong, <laughs> utterly overwhelming. Uh, if you look at the uh, legal availability, I stress legal availability, supply versus demand and consequent consumption. In uh, America, America and the United Kingdom in these eight periods, before 1870, 20, 60, 60, 60, 60, you've got free availability of alcohol, rationing, free avail availability. Um, you know, when I say free availability, it's actively marketed through every media cha channel. Um, Prohibition of alcohol. Uh, then free availability of opium before 1870, rationing, and then prohibition of all the drugs. And prohibition in America since 1920. And uh, American domestic heroin consumption and other drugs has risen every year, year on year, since 1923 when the drugs were prohibited. Now you've got eight um, uh, experiments, if you like, there, of very illegal availability. And if we look at the consequent demand, in samples of size 62 million and 240 million, average duration of the experiment is half a century, you can do a probability test that states that the chance of this variation arising, quite high chance, 
is less than 1 in 10 followed by 18 zeros. Now, any of those of you who have done science will know that a result reaches significance at something like 0 0.05, 1 in 20. In other words, if I toss a penny 20 times, and they're all heads, sorry, 19 times and they're all heads, it could just possibly happen by chance. But if it's 20 heads in a row, you think the penny is weighted. It's significant. Something's happening. <laughs> and that's similar. We do a scientific experiment. If it could have happened by chance, um, more than 1 in 20 times, it's chance. But this has happened, and the, the chance of it happening, quite randomly, is 1 in 10,000 million, million, million. To all intents and purposes, absolute certainty. Now, actually, we shouldn't be surprised um, by this result because of the enormous variability uh, uh, pressure put upon the independent variable supply. The alcohol and tobacco industry have spent $500 million a year promoting their wares. You know, top space in the uh, television advertising slots at peak viewing times, appealing to the basis motives, you know, drink 10 pints of Watney's and be a real man. And, you know, wife will tell you, anything but a real man. <laughs> 500 million dollars promoting. It's not surprising that it's shifted the graph over in this way, pushing up consumption. And then the Americans and their allies have spent in the drug war 700,000 million dollars. Astronomical sum. So it's not surprising that you get an enormous move in the dependent variable. Now, I haven't come across figures like these since I was a schoolboy, amazed uh, uh, at astronomical figures like the, the number of miles in a light year. And if you look at what has happened in the various societies, I mean, varying empirically the supply, uh, the English were actually at the happy medium of minimum consumption in the 1930s when we rationed alcohol to crackle. We are now over here with alcohol and over there with drugs. Look what's happened to the Dutch with cannabis. Consumption's fallen. Now if they started marketing it and promoting it and saying, buy Marxist cannabis, they'd probably go beyond the minimum and start to it. Gorbachev, interestingly, wanted to stop all the Russians being drunk and slammed on the brakes. They started stilling their own. And Gorbachev is, was nothing if not a shrewd guy. He could please every car of this. And undid it a bit. And so Russian consumption went back in this direction. And is now quite respectable vis-à-vis um, -vis other um, countries. So, as I say, um, <coughs> free markets promote consumption. Black markets peddle consumption. Only regulated markets control consumption. And the great fallacy of Western uh, governments promoting prohibition as control of drugs is that, of course, prohibition produces the opposite of control. It produces total loss of control. Or if you legalize drugs, you'll have, uh, have drugs on every street corner. What do you think we've got now in all our inner city? And a lot of the district ones. Control by a ration. And it can be done fiscally in lots of other ways. It doesn't have to involve doctors at all. It's totally inappropriate. Reduces incidence, reduces crime, and improves health. It's humane and helpful. I needn't condone drug use any more than a GP giving a contraceptive pill to a girl condones promiscuity. Whereas the prohibition increases incidence, increases crime, and destroys health. It's inhumane and punitive and makes drugs unnecessarily alluring to adolescents. And in case you think this um, policy is rather uh, unusual, extraordinary, radical, outrageous, only having minority support, this is a list of some of the supporters. All four of the serious English newspapers, Telegraph, Guardian, Times, Independent. 
70% of family doctors, who are the most conservative specialty in the British medical profession. Four out of five, 80%.